God's grace, mercy, and peace are yours in Jesus Christ. Now, I, I know that not everyone in this room is interested in Major League Baseball. I further know that even fewer of you are interested in Chicago Cubs baseball. <laughs> but if you'll indulge me for a minute, I do have a point I want to make from something that's going on in the, in the Cubs season this year. I don't know if you realize this. Did you know that uh, it's been since 2009, since 2009, since the Cubs have won more games than they've lost? It's been a while, right? We've had a hard time lately. But, uh, in fact, in season 2011, we only won 61 games, lost triple digits. We lost over 100 games that season. We began to expect certain things from our beloved Cubbies that we expected that they would lose. This year, however, at this point, as of this morning, we have 77 wins and only 57 losses. In fact, yeah, we have a wild card spot for the playoffs, and we are third in the entire division. In fact, we have better records than the leaders of the other two divisions, even though we're just in a harder division, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, we have a new manager this year. His name is Joe, and he has a plan. He has a plan that he is working out with the Chicago Cubs players, and he has recruited uh, some pretty good baseball players. I'm not going to go through the whole lineup, okay? But I did want to highlight a couple. <laughs> so, so anyway, Chris Bryant, our third baseman, he's a rookie this year, and he's been the Rookie of the Month for the National League both in April and August. He's got some skills. He has, uh, he's an all-star player in his first year in the, in the major leagues, was in the home run derby, 21 home runs this season. And, uh, in fact, he was the player of the year when he played in the minors. So that's Chris Bryant. Anthony Rizzo, the other corner, he's our first baseman. He has hit 26 home runs this year, seventh in the National League. Um, he's been an all-star for two years in a row. And uh, he, has, he is number one in the National League for being hit by pitches. So I just thought you'd uh, get on base however you can, right? Okay, anyway. Um, and he's, he's been hit by a pitch 25 times, 26 homers. So, you know, <laughs> anyway, we have uh, our pitcher, Jake Arrieta, won yesterday, puts him at 18 wins for the season. He is first in the National League. As pitchers, he, uh, he just finished a, a no-hitter, no-score game, pitched the whole thing against the Dodgers a couple weeks ago. He has three complete pitched games. He's first in the National League, and he has three shutouts, also first in the National League. That's my cups for you, right? Now, the reason I said all that is to go back to the fact that he has a plan. Joe, our manager, has a plan. And it started with choosing the right players. Choosing with players who had skills and choosing players that uh, would contribute to the team and would work well together and all this kind of thing. And so he chose likely people, likely players to be on this team. His plan is to, I hope, I hope his plan is to win the World Series, Right? But God's plan is much greater than that, much greater. His plan is to get you back, to get everybody back. He wants to win us back because he loves us. And, it, and this is the part of the story where we discover that one of God's key components in getting everybody back was not to choose, not to choose the most likely. He did not choose the heroes. He chose those who would really benefit from his love, not necessarily that they were the likely ones to get it done, not likely to build a nation. He chooses some unlikely people. He starts with people like Abraham, and, well, Abram and Sarai. And so if you're going to follow along today, you'll notice in the outline that I've given you all the points, there's no fill in the blanks, but I still encourage you that there will be some points along the way that you might want to jot down a note. So as we see that first God has a plan, he says in in chapter 12 of Genesis, the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. So he's telling Abram to leave everything that's comfortable to him, everything he knows, everyone in his family except his closest. He ends up taking Sarai, his wife, a nephew named Lot, some slaves, you know, some servants and possessions, but they leave everything and go. But Abram and Sarai were not like, you know, collector card people. They were, they were old, and they were childless. So if God's plan is to build a nation, wouldn't you choose somebody, a family with already a bunch of kids running around, maybe? You know, parents and children, and then even grandchildren, maybe, and get a good start, 
But God chose Abram and Sarai, childless and well past the age of childbearing, it tells us. And not only that, but they were idol worshipers. They worshiped other gods. And this is who God chose. Maybe unlikely for his plan to be fulfilled. But you go on from them and to their kids. Uh, we heard about Isaac already. Isaac marries Rebekah. And what do you know? They go without children for 20 years. And then they have two. And these two are not spectacular. Right? They've got some issues. They, these were boys of dishonor, maybe. And, and they follow really in the steps of Cain and Abel with hating each other, and while Esau didn't actually kill Jacob, he wanted to. And so we have them, you know, two boys of dishonor, and the family splits, and uh, Jacob goes, uh, you know, off one direction, Esau stays there. And then, as you uh, heard, as Nolan summarized this story, Jacob is known for being deceitful, and for cheating and swindling, and this is who God is working through to build his nation. He, in fact, he's the second born. The reason he cheated Esau out of his inheritance was because he wasn't getting as much. He's the second born, didn't, and that's the way it went. Firstborn got all of it, or at least most of it, and Jacob wanted more, and he was jealous, and he was banished. You know, his mom says, your brother's going to kill you. You better go, and so he lives in shame. He carries shame for years and years. These are the people, the unlikely people that God chooses to begin building his nation his plan. God chooses unlikely people. It's a good thing because I think we're all unlikely people. He chooses us and God reveals his plan. He reveals his presence to these people over and over again. He reveals his power and most of all, he reveals his love, his unending, never failing love. He reveals this to them and through them over and over again, so that today we can sit here and say, we know God is a God who always succeeds with his plans, a God who always succeeds in fulfilling his desire to know people, for people to know he loves them, and to forgive them and provide a way, a way for them. This, as we've talked about already, and I think we'll continue to mention at different ways that there is an upper story and a lower story happening simultaneously. The lower story is pretty much what we see, and the upper story is what God sees. And even in the midst of God having a plan, his plan includes both the upper story and the lower story. His upper story of providing the Savior, the, the Savior that he promises in Genesis chapter 3, the one who will crush the serpent's head, fulfilling that promise by calling a people to building a nation so the lower story tells us other things about God's mercy and his grace and his forgiveness and that he chooses a plan and follows through on it even when people sometimes seem to get in the way, sometimes work against him. Point two is God's plan is, he reveals what his plan is, his plan is to redeem, to redeem us, to get us back. Again from chapter 12 of Genesis, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I'm guessing many of you are familiar with the comedian Bill Cosby. Um, I think several of his skits are quite hilarious, including the dentist chair. I don't know if you've seen the dentist chair where it's an old one. I mean, you still have to spit in the bowl, the, you know, the white porcelain bowl and things of that nature. He talks about how the spit goes from his chin back to the bowl and back and forth. He also talks about, um, about when he takes care of the children and he feeds them for breakfast, he feeds them chocolate cake. Maybe you remember that one. Um, and so, you know, dad is great. He gives us chocolate cake. And, uh, and they're singing his praises until mom comes around. But the one I wanted to tell you about for t this morning was the fact he's, you know, they have a discipline policy in their family, and the way he describes it is his wife does most of the disciplining of the children, and he sees himself as the soccer goalie, just keeping them in play while, while mom keeps spanking them. And, uh, and so he says, but this is the line he comes up with. He says, listen, son, I'll take you out of this world. And it doesn't matter to me because I'll make another one that look just like you. Right? You familiar with that line? That is not. And if, if anybody could say it, it'd be God. 
But he does not say that. God does not just take people out of the world and say, I'll make another one that looks just like you. He wants you. And he wants to bless you through Abraham. All nations will be blessed because through Abraham comes the Savior, Jesus Christ himself. He didn't just say, oh, you're done. Mistake, you're gone. He says, I want you. And you know, I find that as I, as I think, you know, over my 20 plus years of counseling and working with uh, couples, many times contemplating divorce, a common theme that I find in that situation when two people are sitting in my office and saying, we're done, is that they want to start over with someone else. They just, you know, they tired of fighting or situation with whoever they're married to at that time, and they're like, they get to a point, it's like, I just want to start over with someone else. God does not just start over with someone else. He wants you, and he wants to get you back and bring you back to him. And so each one of us sitting here right now are blessed by the promise that God made to Abram that is recorded for us in Genesis chapter 12. You are blessed. You are the ones who are blessed by the promise God made. When he says to Abram, count the stars, that's how many people will be blessed. Count the, the grains of sand. We are some of those stars. We are some of those grains of sand that have been blessed by the promise that God made to Abram thousands of years ago. He wants you. Now, it may be difficult sometimes to understand his plan, point three. It may be difficult to see what's going on. Sometimes the lower story is not, you know, we, it's hard to see the upper story and what's going on up there and all we can see is right in front of us. And, and Abram and Sarah have those same experiences from Genesis chapter 15. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? I mean, several things have been going on since Abram left his home place, his hometown, and moved here. And he has won some battles and he has grown in wealth and many things are taking place, but he says to God, there's still one thing that you haven't done. There's still one thing I'm not understanding. I've been waiting. It's been years. I'm waiting. When I'm still childless, God, if you, if you hadn't noticed, I'm still childless. And my estate, everything I've got is going to a servant. And Abram, Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant my household will be my heir. Then later on, so later on, God does give Sarah and, and Abraham a son named Isaac. And he grows, and we get to another point in the story where God says, okay, Abram, now I'm going to test your love for me. I'm going to test your faith. And he says, then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. It's a very similar language to when he said to Abram years ago, to leave your home country and go to a place I will show you. Now take your son Isaac, whom you love, your only son, take him to a mountain that I will show you, and you will sacrifice him there. Abraham must have been thinking, I don't, this doesn't, your plan is not making sense to me. First, you promised me a son, and it takes a long time for me to receive this son. Now I have a son, and you're going to take him away. And that's going to be at my own hand to sacrifice him on this place. God repeatedly asked Abram to trust him. And he repeatedly asked us to trust him. If you have children, you have done that with your own children. You have asked them to trust you. It might be as simple as getting them to jump into the pool, and you promise to catch them. It could be something greater. It could be instruction you're giving them about direction in life and decisions they're making. And you're saying, trust me. I know what I'm talking about. I've been down that road. I have some wisdom I want to share with you. I give it to you because I love you. And so as a parent, we have said, trust me. Just as God says to Abraham, trust me. And he says to us, put your trust in me, in Christ alone. When I ask people to go on a missions trip with me, I am asking people to trust me. And when I take youth, I'm asking their parents to trust me. And I have led missions trips all around the world. And I have taken kids to Mexico, and I've taken kids to Thailand, and I've taken kids. And so I'm asking them, trust me. And I'm asking parents, trust me with your most 
precious, right? And then we get on the missions trip, and I start saying, this is what you're going to be doing, and this is what you'll work on, and this is who you'll work with. And I am asking them to trust me. And really what I'm asking them to do is trust me as I'm trusting God that he's going to lead us through this whole thing and that his ministry will be done. But we continually ask people to trust over and over again. And so what God is saying to Abraham and teaching Abraham, who used to be an idol worshiper, but now is a worshiper of the Almighty God, he is saying, live by faith, Abraham. Live each moment by faith. Even when what's going on in your lower story doesn't seem to be making much sense, trust that God knows what he's doing, that he has a plan. And, and, and both Paul and the he, author of Hebrews write and say that because Abraham believed, it was credited to him as righteousness. So God is saying to us, live each moment by faith. In this moment, live by faith. In the next moment, live by faith. In the next moment, live by faith. Always by faith in Christ alone. But we get impatient. We don't like the things that are happening in our life. We don't like the frustration, the fear, the worry. And so we say, well, I'm going to make my own plan, which is exactly what Abraham and Sarah did, right? They came up with their own plan. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she comes up with her own plan. So she said to Abram, now think about how, how closely related this is to Genesis, right? Genesis chapter 2 and 3, where Ab- um, Adam and Eve were in the garden, the perfect garden, been given the instructions, eat from everything except the one. And then you have the serpent who tempts Eve, and Eve says to her husband, here. Sarah says, here, Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. What we are tempted to do, the same thing that Sarai was tempted, the same thing Eve was tempted with, is to doubt God's love. When we doubt God's love, then we start to think maybe he's holding out on us. Think about this for a second. Eve believed that the serpent, I mean really, the serpent loved her more than God did. But she trusted the serpent's words over God's words. And so when when we begin to doubt God's love for us, we are so open to temptation. So open to temptation. Trust that God loves you. Can you imagine what it would be like if we all believed God loves us as much as he truly loves us? Can you imagine what that would be like? We would not need, we have no need to come up with self-love. We'd kind of erase selfishness, I think. We would have no need to get other people to love us to fill that void when we truly believe that God loves us as much as he says he loves us. Now, Sarah, we would say, I think you would agree with me, Sarah blew it. She made up her own plan to get done what God had promised. And she blew it. God is gracious to us even when, when we mess up. I'm going to actually read this passage from the story. It's on page 17, it's from Genesis 21, and as Teresa and I were reading this out loud with one another, it just struck me so profoundly. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised. God is gracious. We mess it up sometimes, many times. But God is gracious, and even in this situation, he gave to Sarah. I mean, again, think about that for a second. How many times do we feel like, oh, that was too big of a mistake, or too many mistakes now, or God's going to be done with me now? And yet Sarah, who came up with a totally different plan and caused all kinds of really some dire consequences, God says, because I promised you, I'm gracious to you, and he gives her what he had promised to begin with. You know, man ruined... Man ruined God's perfect creation. God says everything was good. Everything was very good when he finished. And only a little while later in the story, he was grieved that he had made man and he destroys everybody but Noah and his family. But God's love never fails. We fail. 
But God's love never fails. His love for you will never fail, which which brings us to our final point this morning. You are included in his plan. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram. This is when he was sacrificing his son Isaac. Caught by its horns, he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide, and to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. That mountain that we believe, that God says, I will show you where to go to sacrifice your son, is the same mountain where Jesus Christ was sacrificed years later. Abraham says, this is the mountain where it will be provided. The Lord will provide. And he provided his one and only son to be sacrificed on that cross for our forgiveness and salvation so that we could be joined together with God again. He got us back through his son. As you heard in the gospel reading, and listen to how closely it relates to Genesis 22, take your son, your only son whom you love, and sacrifice him. That's what God told him told Abraham to do. And we read from John chapter 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So Abraham ascended that mountain to sacrifice his son and God provided a sacrifice there and God provided a sacrifice for us in Christ, the ultimate and final sacrifice. So while I did say that man ruined God's perfect creation, nothing can ruin, no one can ruin God's perfect plan, his plan to get you back. There is a way, and it's through his son, Jesus Christ. God sent his son to save you. So Jesus, he left his home, and he came here. He left his family, the Father, and came to earth to dwell among us. I hope, I hope that this provides you with hope, that we may be Unlikely people, but God chooses us. And we break promises and we sin and don't follow. We don't live in line with God's will. And he continues to fulfill his promises to us because he is gracious and kind and faithful. And you are included in something that is extremely significant. Abraham was included in something significant, right? Abraham and Sarai, Sarah. Building a nation. Sorry, I know I've changed their names back and forth throughout all, this, all the morning. But he includes you in something extremely significant. Abraham did not come up with the plan, but by faith, he trusted in God. We don't have to come up with a plan, but by faith, we trust in God. Father in heaven, we thank you for your wonderful story. And we thank you that you are writing our story and including us in your story. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the sacrifice through your son, Jesus Christ. And thank you for the forgiveness of sins and that you love us and have gotten us back. Through Jesus Christ, amen.